Welcome to a new series here on the Wars of Rebellion channel based on my book, The Soul War Battles of Macon. After repulsing two cavalry assaults against Macon and Sherman having left the area continuing on his way to Savannah, Macon seemed safe. However, the peace was not to be. In the dying months of the rebellion, Macon one last time became a target. In this time, there were insufficient defenders and a lack of willingness to fight. Some of the final stages of the war took place in this small community in middle Georgia. On March 22, 1865, Brevet Major General James H. Wilson departed with his cavalry division from northern Alabama. He intended to finally bring the war's reality to the so far untouched regions of Alabama and Georgia. Hoping to terminate his raid in Georgia's industrial center, maybe Columbus or Macon, Wilson took his force from northern Alabama into the depths of the state, attacking Tuscaloosa and Montgomery. Faced with an ace in Bedford Forrest's cavalry, Wilson kept a close eye on the feared and murderous cavalry commander. By April 16, a week after Robert E. Lee had surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse, Wilson's men prepared their assault on Columbus. With Columbus fallen, making the likely next target, the local authorities called for the organization of a cavalry unit to defend the city against ginky vandals and prevent the devastation of the land. By April 18, the railroad depots in Macon were crowded with people, some trying to take the Macon and Western Railroad to take refuge in Atlanta. The refugees never made it, as the local citizenry outside of Barnesville stops the train, claiming the proximity of the enemy and turns the train around back to Macon. Interestingly, only a day before, the Confederate military industrial complex had shipped two trainloads of ammunition from the arsenal to the Confederate front lines, wherever they may have been at that time. Besides a woeful state of preparation, the city also seemed increasingly isolated from national events. While the Army of Northern Virginia had surrendered over a week ago, the making papers still lacked news from Appomattox, or had not seen fit to report it. Meanwhile, on April 18 in Columbus, General Wilson ordered Colonel Minty's division to advance towards Macon. Needing to cross the Flint River, Minty sent Lieutenant Colonel Pritchard with a force of Michigan and Third Ohio ahead on a forced march to Double Bridges, 54 miles from Columbus, was ordered to save them at all hazards. Pritchard did extremely well, pushing the enemy so closely that the rebels had to abandon their three pieces of artillery. In addition, Captain Hudson of the Force Michigan led an unusual and successful saber charge. By the evening of April 19, Minty's force was three miles from Tomaston, where they destroyed three cotton factories. On April 20, Colonel White's 17th Indiana, Minty's lead element, scattered an advance guard of 200 to 400 rebel cavalry along the Tomaston Road near Spring Hill, 21 miles from Macon. Caught by surprise by the superior equipped U.S. veteran cavalrymen, the rebel forces withdrew after a couple of charges from the U.S. forces. The road to Macon lay wide open. 
At the bridge over Tobaskovsky Creek, Minty's men once more encountered resistance. About 300 men had entrenched on the other side of the bridge. Especially troublesome to Minty were the enemy sharpshooters. The rebels had taken position behind a rail barricade. There were clear signs of destruction, with the planking torn up and even fire damage to the bridge. A cavalry charge across the bridge stalled when the man discovered the missing planks. Therefore, the cavalrymen dismounted and crossed on the burning stringers in the most gallant manner, routing the enemy and saving the bridge. Having chased off the rebel forces, Minty's men had drawn dangerously close to Macon. Thirteen miles from the city, three miles from the Tobaskovsky Bridge, Colonel White encountered a flag of truce. He decided to send the dispatch down the line to Colonel Minty, halting the advance towards Macon until he had received instructions. By this point, the cavalrymen had traversed 104 miles in 48 hours. With only a few miles to the city, the phenomenal march stalled briefly. As Minty and Wilson read and contemplated the rebel message, White had resumed his dash towards Macon. Minty had ordered White to give the flag of truce party a five minute head start, and then to resume the advance and to take the flag of truce party prisoner if they were on the road. Along the road to Macon, Minty's men saved another bridge before rebel forces could burn it. Before Wilson could catch up, White had forced the city to surrender and taken its defenders captive. Minty reported five generals, 345 officers, and 1,843 enlisted men prisoners, as well as 80 artillery pieces captured. At 8.30 p.m., Wilson finally reached Macon and immediately sought an interview with the city commander. Despite the fighting having ceased in Virginia and North Carolina, Wilson was unaware of the cessation when he departed Columbus for Macon. Having twice repulsed U.S. cavalry forces, there was some hope that Macon's defenders could repeat that feat. However, rebel authorities were not prepared to defend the city like they had been the previous year. Wilson's cavalry easily captured Macon. The spirit of war was broken in Macon.